It's so good to have you guys here for this special day. Um, let's really pose so we can put it on video because I think this is an important message that um, we're going to talk about today. And I'm going to talk about the Last Supper today. And of course, with that comes in the cross work and all that, but there's so much that happened within that Last Supper. And uh, I want to talk about that. And there's something, how many know the Bible's for us? Anybody? You believe that every word that's written in the Bible, is there something for us? How many would you agree with that? So there is something in that story about the supper for us that we need to grab a hold of. Amen? He, that was done for a purpose for us. That supper, the last supper uh, on that Passover time, there, there was something done for us, and I want to bring that out today. There was something great done for us that day. As I study and I find the greatness that Jesus did in, in, in that place before death. Today, we remember what he did for us, but we're not sad today. Amen? So I can joke around on Good Friday. Everybody say, you can joke around on Good Friday. <laughs> That's good. Because we are happy. We are excited that Jesus is alive. This is um, a story of remembering and bringing it back into our remembrance of what he did for us so that we can be tuned into his blessing. Amen? And so we can be excited about this. Like, I, I grew up in a Mennonite culture, and, and these were sad days, okay? Like, you can't be happy on Good Friday. First of all, where, what, if it's a Good Friday, why, is it, why are you sad? It's good. Good Friday. <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. And I was, look, I was, it really baffled me this week. I said, why in the world did they call it Good Friday? In pure language, it was a translated from the word holy. And so it was Holy Friday or um, Sovereign Friday or anything like that. It, it, it's in the translation, that's what some think. Some think it's just because it is good because what Jesus did for us. There's really no defined answer, but the, the majority show that it was, some people call it Good Friday, some people call it Holy Friday, some people in different areas call it different day, different things. So uh, it's a good thing. And if it was a Holy Friday, that means there was something that was separated for his people. That means there was something given for us if it was holy, because holy means um, separated for the purpose of God. It means to be put aside for the purpose of God. Amen? And so today is that day. Now, we've been doing Good Fridays ever since we started Sunday morning services, even before that, actually. And Good Fridays was something we just do because we feel that it can be a place of connection. And it doesn't mean that we'll, we're always going to run the same thing. And today I'm talking about something very differently than I would have done any other Good Friday. So... And I want to focus on communion. I want to focus on what Jesus did for us. Are you excited? Yes. I'm excited about this word, and we're not going to try to make it too long. Luke chapter 22, 15 to 20. Luke chapter 22, 15 to 20. Oh, by the way, Zoe's back there with the small kids, and she's going to play with them, if any small kids. So you guys are free to uh, let Zoe know that you want them to watch your smaller kids. I'm not talking about the kids at her age, but I'm talking about <laughs> she'll watch the smaller ones and play around with them. Uh, so... Here we go. Today's a day of communion and a, a Good Friday. So in Luke chapter 22, verse 15 to 20, but before that, if you read before that, that's where um, it actually says, the Bible says, Satan entered into Judas. And there's times in our life where, where we go in the presence of God and, and there is Satan that enters into or interferes with stuff in our life. Now, if we look later on, Satan did the same thing to Peter. But it's what's what we do with the circumstances that we have that really make a difference. And so the, just to know the little history of that, it was where Judas was there and he was starting to, to he got money hungry. And so they kind of paid him that he would betray Jesus. And Jesus still allowed Judas to be part of the supper. So there'll be times in our life where where we think where God is moving us forward and, and we believe that his cup or his bread is being spread around in our church and we might have people here that are not here for the same purpose as we are. But their heart can be changed to the same purpose. So always be aware that you're always around people. You're always around uncertainty. You're always around I'm not knowing for sure what's going to happen next. But that's why family is important to me. That's why to get to know people is important to me. But, you know, when I look at Judas, Jesus knew him for a long time. And, um, but we got, uh, that's not my story today, but though I might walk into that a little bit. Let's look at verse 15. This is after that. He got there, and, and they were in the Passover, and, and so he was saying, you know what? And verse 15, he says, and he said to them, with desire I, sorry, <laughs> with desire I have desire to eat. This is King James again. 
I desire to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. And Jesus says, I desire to eat with you. I desire to, uh, I have a craving, Jesus says here. Now, you've got to grab a hold of this. I'm going to build a small foundation, but you've got to grab a hold of this. I crave to eat with you before I, get, I suffer. I crave. I desire, I long to eat with you. This is, was an importance to Jesus that was so important to him. He says, I got to do this before I suffer. This has to be done. This is part of God's plan. This is part of the protocol. This is part of the steps to the cross. I have to eat with you. I desire, I long for it. And so the eating with us was a very important thing. The Last Supper was important to him. How many know we don't eat the Last Supper no more? We just remember it. We don't eat it no more. Sunday, you got to come and hear about the New Supper. <laughs> that's a Sunday morning and I, I, I feel so excited about Sunday I, might even, I have to retain myself not to share it all today because then we're going to be here for an hour instead of half an hour <laughs> or so <laughs> I always give myself room for mistakes don't I? or so sometimes there's more than one O behind that and so with I desire to eat the Passover before I suffer this word desire is that that I, it's almost, it's that such strong desire. Get me, this is a translation from the Greek. Just, it's such a strong desire. It's like you lust for something. How many of you ever desired something so much that you think you have to have it, even if it's not on sale? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. If this is that kind of craving for it. I'm not talking about the, the, the sexual. I'm talking about we, we crave after this so much. I don't care what it costs me, I'm going to do it. This is that, that's how strong a craving Jesus had here. Jesus said, I'm craving this for so long that, that this has to be done. I, I got I to gotta do this. And then he says the Passover, this Passover, of course, is the Easter. It's a place of a custom. It is, he, he wanted to be religious for the last time. This Passover, if you study, it was the custom of the Passover. He wanted to fulfill something, and he needed to fulfill something, and he needed to go by the rules of the law. He needed to fulfill himself with the Passover with this place. Verse 16 says, For I say to you, I, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Meaning this is my last supper, and I won't eat with you again until this is fulfilled. Meaning that I'm going to fulfill the old to create a new in your life. I, 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 you need to eat this. We need to eat together, and we need to be obedient to the law, and we need to be obedient to what is happening here so that the new thing can come in. How many know that Jesus is, is creating a place here and saying that I'm going to bring you a new covenant. But before I do that, there has to be something that has to be fulfilled here. And so Jesus did it in the law. He fulfilled himself within the law at this moment. And he's creating himself a fulfillment to, to walk into a place of blessing. Because he was kind of a, I don't know if sneaky is the right word, but he worked in the law and he was kind of sneaky and brought a supernatural in the supper. <laughs> he, he just kind of said, you know, we're going to get together in this Passover and we're going to eat the Easter feast and we're going to have this. But he had some plans Maybe he had an agenda here. And that's what the, I want to reveal you the agenda he had for us. He says, the law at this moment will be a blessing for the son. And, and I'm going to close that and I'm going to fulfill it and, and, and what I need to do. And then verse 16, it says that. He says, fulfill. This means this, I won't eat again. This was a remembrance of the last time. I won't eat again until the, it's fulfilled. Until the, this is fulfilled. I won't eat again with you until this is fulfilled. Everybody say fulfilled. fulfilled. You know what that means? That means complete. That means the old law was completed at this moment. Until this is fulfilled, I won't eat with you again. I, you need to see this because it's important. I want to grab my water. And it's important to understand what the law was. So what it is for us today is a fulfilled law that brought in understanding for the new covenant. And so here we go. He says, until the kingdom of God, and I, <laughs> I love the word fulfilled. It means so much. It means to be fulfilled, to mean being, uh, until it's furbished, until the kingdom of God is furbished. There was something missing for the kingdom of God. Not the kingdom of God there, but the kingdom of God within his people. I want to fulfill something. And Jesus Christ was a fulfillment of the kingdom of God so that we can have the kingdom of God at hand. Amen. And so he wanted to fulfill. So today, when we're going to do communion, I want you to remember that we're doing a fulfillment, but we're also eating a new meal today too. 
this is not the old no more. This is a remembrance of the old with something new. Amen? So we fulfill. So, you know, the first, the first thing about um, the Last Supper, there are two things that I want to talk about. One, the first part where I just talked about was that the Last Supper was there to fulfill the old. To fulfill the old. That was my number one statement is uh, the Last Supper was there to fulfill the old for us so that we can have something new. Before Jesus died, they had to sacrifice goats. They had to sacrifice lambs. They had to sacrifice things. They had to, Jesus became the lamb at this moment. Jesus became that meal, okay? Jesus became that meal. Remember in the sacrifice where they sacrificed something and they ate the meal after they sacrificed? Well, Jesus became that meal here. Jesus became that sacrificial meal here, okay? As, as we walk into this anointing here, okay? He, he became and he offered himself to be that living sacrifice, not the dead sacrifice at that moment. He, he allowed himself to, to be part of the supper. And so this is a place where it probably happened the night before, but it happened in that place of this getting ready for the crucifixion. Now, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about crucifixion. I mean, it just blow, flows in there, but I really want to focus on this because I want to focus on the blessing of what he did and why he did it. And then number, the second point of... Um, having the Last Supper was to give out purpose. I believe, and I'm going to share you some scripture, I believe that he was giving out the purpose of himself to the people. He broke his body and he gave it to his disciples. He broke himself. And he brought a resemblance of what you have when I rise up again. You, he, he actually ordained, or if you want to say set out people on purpose at this moment. You were set out purpose on the Last Supper. He purposed us on the Last Supper. He, he gave out himself, and he said, do this in remembrance of me. Remember what I did for you, because you have purpose in life. Amen? So let's look at the next verse, verse 17. It says, and he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he said, take this and divide it among yourself. Everybody say divide. divide. He didn't take one cup and say, here, drink it yourself. This is my body. I just want you, my favorite John, to take this. He didn't do that, did he? See, the thing is, what we do as Christians today, we, 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 we carry this cup and we think it's all ours. We think that the blood is all ours alone. And we're not willing to share our talents. We'll, we're not willing to share who we are with others sometimes. And we think that we can do it alone. But he says, no, here, divide it among yourself. Divide, this cup means, the, uh, a, it's, a, it's a place of a vessel. Here, it's my vessel. I'm giving you who I am and start drinking of me. Amen. It's also a place of experience, a purpose. I'm giving you my purpose. I'm giving you my lot. I'm giving you your lot. Your lot means your purpose. I'm giving you an experience right now. I'm giving you Jesus. I'm giving you myself right now. Drink of me so that you can be of me. Drink of me so that you can take who I am in you. Amen? And so he says, here's my purpose. I'm giving out my purpose right now. My cup, my purpose. How many of you want his purpose right now? He's actually giving it out. So when we do communion today, remember that you're drinking your purpose from Christ Jesus. You're drinking the blessing of Jesus Christ within you. It's not the actual drink that you're doing, but you're doing it in remembrance of what he did for us. Amen? It can become actual because you can take it as a spiritual experience, right? Just like when Jesus said, go to the pool and go into the water, it was a matter of obedience, wasn't it? And today is a place of obedience. Today you're going to see great healing through communion. You're going to see great anointing through it if you choose to take it. Amen? I want to be healed. I've got certain viruses that have been going around a lot of people here. We need to be healed in this place. There's things going around. There's pains going around. There's things that don't need to be around. Like, I don't know if you, who was ever here last Sunday, is Jesus never experienced the infirmities. That means that we have the right to know infirmities. We may not always get there because we're human, but we have that right. We have that right to get into the presence of Jesus where there is no sickness. And I want to learn how to get in there. We have created a culture that we just kind of shrub off his Holy Spirit. We shrub off what he sent us. We shrub off that presence that he did for us. We shrub off that blood that he gave us. He, we, we shrub off that purpose with that purity. When we drink this blood, let's remember that Jesus washed us pure, that Jesus washed us clean, that he gave us purpose and destiny, and he cleaned us up from what we were to be something new. Amen? Remember that the cup of blessing is creates purpose because the blood, power of the blood of Jesus clears up things so that you can walk purposefully. Amen? 
So the cup is important. Verse 18, it says, For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit, which means I won't drink of this generation of the vine until the king of God has come. I'm not going to give you the, the bread. That, that's not gonna, I'm not going to eat with you, but I'm also not going to drink with you. I'm not going to drink with you until the king of God. He's basically given himself up here into the place where they remembered him as so that he can walk in the fullness of what Jesus did and to be blessed fully of Jesus. So I, he's, he's fulfilling the old and he's creating a new atmosphere. Sometimes we need to get rid of the old and create a new atmosphere, I'm telling you. We need to just get rid of some things in our life and we need to try to create something new in life. And he says, again, the same word, divide. The cup was divided. The place, it was actually to, to bring apart, it was put into pieces. <laughs> if Jesus did this, if he broke the bread, and he gave it to each one, he, a loaf, there was more, uh, in those days it was more like a tatia or something, there was a flatbread, uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe that's what it was, a flatbread, uh, <laughs> as we know today, and he actually gave it together. Now let's say if I give you a piece, you give it, and I give uh, 100 people a piece, how can that bread become one again? by only puzzling it together. I need to know you and I need to connect to you so I can have part of the bread that Jesus given. I need to have part of the bread of life that's within her and within him and within him to be fulfilled. I need to have the fullness because he divided himself. And the only way I can get the wholeness of Jesus is yes, I'm personally with Jesus just like John and the three were and everybody else was, but at the same time to have the fullness of Jesus we have to come in together and eat together and fellowship together and do something together to do something great together, amen? So now if I want a part of Jesus that was divided which either in the blood or in the bread I have to start connecting to people to see the fulfillment of it so I can see who Jesus really is in the community or in the province or in who we are as a believer. If you sit at home, which is fine if you want to do that, you just have a crumb of Jesus. <laughs> Why not get the bread of the fullness of the bread, a life of Jesus, when you are joining together to see Jesus fully at work? Amen? I want us to grab a hold of this. This is the year. This is the season, I'm telling you, that if we don't join together, we're going to lose as Christians in this world. We are. We need to join together. We need to become a flood together. We need to become a force together to see changes in this world. Amen? How many know Jesus has the power to change this world? And how many know that we are the power? Because if, we are, if he's our head and we are the body, that means we are part of the change. Amen? So if we don't do nothing, the world won't change. We can sit there and say, oh, pray in Jesus' name that we get a new government until we start joining together and seeing a new government. We have a great government here. I'm just using an example, in my opinion. Uh, it's just, we don't, just the word great is over, over exaggerated. We have a good one, but the fact is that I think nobody, if anybody was in there, we would be hated just as much, okay? Would you agree? Even if we don't agree with everything, it means that we're still moving forward as a place. Now, I'm not here to talk about governments. <laughs> but we can change a world when we join together because he says, I won't. This is, why can we do it? It's because Jesus already separated it and he already joined together, and it was last meal he ate, and Sunday I'm going to talk about how the new meal it changes everything. Amen? And so then verse 19 says, And he took the bread, which is a showbread. It was, it was a place of, in the sanctuary. It was in the place of uh, a worship that he did this. He took that place. It was in the place of the Passover. It was a place of Easter. And he brought that holy bread out. And he started dividing it. And he gave thanks, and he broke it. Everybody said, give thanks. Yes, sometimes we just need to give thanks to who we are. And we need to start de connecting, and we need to start, start connecting to his fullness of his body. Amen? <laughs> um, just say, I'm part of the bread. Because Jesus gave himself to us, right? Yes. <laughs> so I'm part of the broken piece. I'm part of that broken piece. That means I have to that Jesus gave thanks for me. Jesus said, I thank God for you. You are part of me. You're part of who I am. When you say yes to Jesus, he's giving thanks about you. He's saying, thank you, sir. Thank you for being in the kingdom. He's thanking. He's thankful for you. Amen? He gave thanks to us. 
He gave thanks. No, I'm not making us holy or anything. I'm just putting a representation across that we are the body of Christ. He represents himself as the bread of life, and he said, here, take of me so that you can be blessed. Amen? Boy, I'm preaching better than I hear amens right now. <laughs> oh, man, you hear so many preachers say that. I get ticked off every time, so I'm trying to tick you guys off. So. <laughs> but you can say amen, amen. Amen? Yeah. And so he gave thanks, and he broke the bread, and he gave. Everybody say gave. gave. I love the word gave. He granted us our purpose. He granted us the gift. He granted us. He gave and he granted us part of him. He, we have a privilege to carry part of him in us. We have a privilege to have Jesus' purpose in us. He granted it to us. He, he, didn't, he didn't even do it. You just have to show up to the supper, then he's going to give. Just show up to the supper. Just show up to the, to, to the meal time. And Jesus wants to bless you in the place of, me, uh, of the harvest. And he wants to give you the bread. He says he gave. This word give is to, to give in one accord. To give a, he's given us the advantage. Just think of his disciples. He, they got the advantage of doing his work. They got advantage of everything around them. And they became so amazing. And they got so amazing that people were scared. Because after Jesus even went to the heavenlies, they were still scared of Jesus. Did you notice the Pharisees, Sadducees, and everybody else that was involved? That was just scared of Jesus. As soon as they saw a miracle and they claimed Jesus, they were scared of him. That bread was alive still. That bread that Jesus handed out was still alive in the world even after Jesus went to the heaven and ascended to the heaven. That bread was so important that it was just alive. Amen? He gave a gift to us. He bestowed a gift to us. He gave himself to us. It's a gift. The word gave was he granted something great to us. He, he furbished us that what was necessary in us. So meaning that this bread was so necessary for him to give it out to himself. He couldn't explain it, how, what he was doing, but he could show what he was doing with himself. And that's why communion is the example. He, he couldn't explain the profoundness of who Jesus was or who he was to God, but he could show the profoundness. He broke our, our bread and he showed the profoundness of who he was. He showed his purpose and he showed that you have purpose in me. Amen? Then he says, <laughs> he gave it to himself. This is my body. Give it, give him for you. This do in remembrance of me. This is Jesus' words. He says, do this in remembrance of me. This is my body. He said, this is my body. This word body in the Greek is preferring to the body of Christ. And actually, this is me and you. This is the body of Christ. If you study it in there, it even prefers to the church. The body, this is my church. People, this is my church. I give myself to you to become something greater. John 14, 12. I give this to you. Amen? Are you with me? I give this to you. This is the family. This is my family. This is who you are. Now share this. Why do we need to remember? Because we need to consider breaking his bread more often so more people can receive part of him. Every time we have communion, we start sharing his body. And that body of Christ grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. The body of Christ, it's a resemblance of his body. It's like a bread that never goes away. And people say, well, it was just one loaf at the supper. Well, what did Jesus do with the two fish and five loaves? He, he, he can multiply you. You, you, you are part of the bread. If you can multiply you, that means you can give of him all the time. He multiplies. He, he, he does, it doesn't matter what you are and who you are. If you choose to say yes to Jesus, he will multiply you. Amen? And so now we eat this bread. We, we walk with this, but we do it not just for the purpose of remembrance no more, but we're doing it the purpose of spreading him. Amen? We drink of the wine so we can spread his power of his blood. Amen? And so become a big family of God. You can study yourself. It talks about that. And I love what it also means, that body. It means that, that which casts that shadow of a distinction from the shadow of itself. We have the shadow of Jesus on us. That once we let the light shine, Jesus shadows over us. Amen? And that's what we are. We're carrying the shadow of Jesus. We're carrying the shadow of Jesus right now. Amen? Yes. Hallelujah. Almost done, guys. Verse 20. Likewise, also the cup after the supper, saying, This is my cup. 
in the New Testament uh, in my blood. <laughs> this is where the New Testament was starting to be represented. This was when the power was represented. This is when the new covenant was represented at this time. He said, likewise, this is my cup after supper, saying, this cup is my New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. This is my purpose. This is the drinking vessel. This is the lot. This is, the, this is my cup. This is, this is your purpose to be shed abroad. This is the testament, which is a, a place of prevailing uh, spirit and a, and a place of, of the mental and natural. This is, this is the testament that everything is going to change for you. Your characteristics are going to change. Everything's going to change in your life for who I am. This is my t new testament. This is my new arrangement. This is I'm arranging you something new so you don't have to live in the old no more. So that you can walk in the power of the new. Amen? I'm going to walk into a place. This is my New Testament. Everybody say New Testament. <laughs> there's a reason why they call it the Old Testament and the New Testament. And there's a reason why they call it the Bible. The first, there was the Old Testament. Would you agree? The new was not existence. Then there was the new. But then when Jesus died on the cross and he created the New Testament, it became the Bible because it became a transformed, fulfilled word of Jesus Christ. So I would rather just call it the Bible because the Bible is a chain, life changing where you can take the whole word of God into the new covenant. Amen? We can walk in the new covenant with the whole word of God. I love it. So he's sick to shed. So today when you walk and we're going to walk in communion shortly here but I'm going to talk about two things first. Shortly we're going to walk in communion. Um, first thing is remember when the body is given to you, that you have the privilege to carry part of Jesus in you. People say, I'm fully saved. You are fully saved, but you are fully part of a body. And the Bible says that enough that I don't have to explain that. You can read it all over the place that you have a purpose in life. But when we have the supper together, let's be careful about certain things. Let's not become a Judas or a Peter. If we do become something, we've got to become a Peter where we're repentant. Now, Judas betrayed Jesus, and he couldn't live with himself no more because of it. There's a life where we do things wrong in our life. We can't live with ourselves, so we make big mistakes in life, and we commit suicide in our spiritual, or we just, we just quit. People, people leave Jesus. People leave God just because of that part they can't let go of. They become cold, and eventually become numb to who Jesus really is, and they can't live with that no more. And so you can't be a betrayer, so you... If you are a betrayer, choose to repent today. If you're watching, choose to repent of being a betrayer in the kingdom of God. Where you have misused the power of God, where you have misused Jesus for your own glory and for your own gain. Because that's what um, Judas did. He, he did it for his own gain. He got money. He, got, he did it. But the fact is, when we did it for his own glory, for his own gain, he died, didn't he? He could not survive under that pressure of that greatness of Jesus Christ. Now, Peter... Did, did, I think, probably a little worse than G, if Judas did. He betrayed Jesus three times. He says, I don't know who Jesus is. Three times. To a group of people, he says, I don't know what you're talking about. I am not part of that crowd. How many of us as Christians say, I'm not part of that church. I, 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 I don't, you are, we are hiding sometimes. And not nobody here, of course, but there, it comes in a place where we cannot share with people what Jesus is doing because we are in a denial mode. We can't be a denier. And so Pete was a big denied three times and Jesus warned him saying that, you know what, the way your attitude is going now, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. We, I haven't heard a rooster crow, but we might have a phone crow at us or something, I'm not sure, the alarm clock in the morning. Um, but, <laughs> but the fact is, that don't you agree that denying Jesus is just as bad as betraying Jesus? Would you not agree? But what was the difference there? The difference was that Pete repented and had a revelation that Jesus was the Son of God. And he went back to Jesus. And he owned up to his mistakes. And Jesus utilized him in that. Look at David. Totally, some people call him all kinds of names. He totally wasn't great. But we went back to the heart of God. And today we're going to go back to the heart of God. Let's get our communion stuff ready. Let's get, know that Jesus went to the cross, but he represented the cross work and he gave it to his disciples first. He purposed everyone beforehand. 
He fulfilled the Old Testament. So we didn't have to go back into the old laws no more. But we could look at it through a new set of eyes, through Christ Jesus. So when we look at the tabernacle, we look at spiritually, no? When we look at the sacrifices, now we look at that spiritually, no? We don't actually look at for a goat or, or whatever else they use for sacrifice. We don't look at that anymore. Are we all ready? Does everybody have bread? Does everybody have bread? Yes? Does everybody have bread? Just If you don't have some, just make sure you got one right now. Let's just kind of lift it up a little bit before the Lord. and Let's just uh, let's even, even close your eyes for just a moment and just imagine Jesus breaking it off from his loaf and giving it to you. Just imagine right now with your eyes closed, just imagine Jesus giving you purpose and destiny with this bread. And he's giving you his life right now. He's giving you his body right now. Amen? Let's eat together. Let's eat together. Praise you, Jesus. Hmm. Let's look at the power of the blood, the cup. If we can close your eyes for this one too, just to focus a little bit. Focus how Jesus just poured his blood over you and he shed it for you, for your protection, for your health, for your deliverance, for your freedom. He's given you his blood work. He's given you a place of clear access. It became a window to God. When you look through it, you can look directly into God's eyes and directly into God's heart through his blood. And you can have a direct connection to Jesus Christ and through God himself. Amen? Just to look at the power of the blood, the power of your health. When we drink this, if you have a sickness today, you have a pain today, believe when this goes down, the power of the Holy Spirit will go down with it. And it will heal you today. Amen? Maybe uh, somebody needs healing for something. I'm going to claim healing. I'm claiming healing for my back. Everybody say something aloud that you want healing for if you want. I'm doing it for my back. Anybody else have something? Back? Yeah. Just say it. Yeah. Let's just claim the healing while this goes on. Let's drink together. Praise you, Jesus.